Hello everyone, I'm Ke Gangli. Today I'm going to do a brief introduction about our project and talk about the load criteria that we used in this project. The target building is a four-layer office building, which is located in the city of Brea in California. It's a normal, uh, normal building without any a special requirement. So the building code uh, we are using is uh, California Building Code 2019 CBC. Also the ACI 318 is another important uh, reference. Our goal is to design the size and the reinforcement of the concrete to sustain the loads adequately and safely. Here's the uh, our work scope, it includes a one-way concrete slab and the reinforced beams and the supporting gravity columns and typical walls and the basement wall. So all the construction uh, we use uh, the concrete, uh, the concrete we use 4,000 PSI. And uh, we use uh, Grade 60 steel for the reinforcement for the rebars and ties. Here's the load criteria given. For the typical floor, we got dead load is 160 and the, the life load is 65. As you can see, most of the dead load is come from the slabs safely. Okay, so for the roof. We got that load is 110 and the life load is 20 PSF. So based on that, when come to the design, we have to use the wood made load, right? So we are, we are plus, uh, we multiply the, the factor to make it safer. So we are using 1.4 dead load uh, or we use the 1.2 dead load plus the 1.6 uh, life load, whichever is bigger, we are using. It. So to determine the the actual load, we need to do a lot of analysis. We need to calculate or use the software to decide the moment and force on each section. And we need to decide the, the tributary area for the beams and the columns. We also need to think about the, the, the soil pressure and the, the force uh, working on the, the wall. So after that, we can decide the load demand both the service and the, the factor and go ahead to calculate the, the reinforcement we needed. Okay, that's it. So let's move on to next part for detailed design. Thank you. Hi, my name is Christine Lay and I will be discussing the beam design for this project. The initial components that have been considered for the design of B1 and B2 are included in the following table. And so these values include the yield strength, the concrete strength, the dead load and live load, the beam spam, the beam self weight for B1 and B2, the tributary width, the design load for B1 and B2, and the effective flange width for B1 and B2 the slab thickness, the beam height, and the clear cover. Next, we will have to find the shear moment demand for a continuous beam with equal spans using the moment and shear coefficients in this diagram. As you can see, the maximum shear demand for beam B1 is 28.10 kips, and for B2, it is 53.66 kips. For the moment demand, the maximum moment for B1 will be 83.97 kip feet, and the maximum moment for B2 is 160.38 kip feet. In the case of positive bending moment, we have to calculate for the bottom 
reinforcement, meaning that we have to provide tension at the bottom. And so the following calculations on the slide are for beam B1. We first have to calculate for the required steel area using this equation. AS required is equal to the maximum moment of 83.97 kip feet divided by the feed factor times the yield strength times 0 0.9 multiplied by the depth, which is 1.88 inches squared. Next, we will have to calculate for the minimum steel area, which is three times the square root of the concrete strength times the beam width multiplied by the depth divided by the yield strength, which comes out to 0 0.42 inches squared. With this minimum area, we have decided to provide three number eight rebars. We then calculated the compression block depth A, which is equal to the amount of steel times the yield strength divided by 0 0.85 times the concrete strength times the width of the beam, which comes out to 0 0.65 inches. 0 0.65 inches is less than the slab thickness of 12 inches, and therefore the concrete section is a rectangular section. We then need to find C, which is the distance from the outer compressive fiber to the neutral axis, and that is equal to the compression block depth A divided by beta 1. C then comes out to 0 0.77 inches. We will next calculate for the ratio C over D to obtain the fee factor that we will use to calculate the nominal moment strength. So C divided by D is equal to 0 0.07, and using this value, we find that the fee factor is 0 0.90. Once that is determined, we will calculate for the nominal moment strength with the equation phi times the steel area multiplied by the yield strength times the depth minus the compression block depth divided by 2, which comes out to 113.85 kips. The nominal moment strength is greater than the applied design, which was determined as 83.97 kip feet, and therefore the design is ideal. This process is repeated for calculating the bottom reinforcement for B2. We will next calculate for the top reinforcement in the case of negative bending moment. The calculations provided on the slide are in regard to beam B1. And so the first step will be to calculate for the steel area once again. And we get 2.454 inches squared. Next, we Calculate for the minimum steel area uh, located on bullet points two and three. And as you can see, we get 2.22 inches squared and 2.35 inches squared. And so from these calculations, we determined that we will be using four number eight rebars. We next calculate for the compression block depth once again and we get the value of 4.65 inches, which is greater than the slab thickness of three inches, and therefore this concrete section is considered a T-section. And so we will have to calculate for A2, which is a part of the flange depth, and comes out to 0 0.31 inches. And then in order to find the actual compression block depth, we will add the slab thickness plus A2, which comes out to 3.31 inches. We then calculate for C, and that comes out to 3.89 inches. And then we calculate for the ratio C over D to obtain the fee factor, and that is equal to 0 0.35, which is less than 0.375. And so this is tension controlled, and the fee factor is 0 0.90. We then determine the nominal moment strength with this equation, phi times the flange couple plus the web couple, which comes out to 126.75 kip feet. And phi mn is greater than mu, and therefore our design is valid. And so uh, to calculate for the top reinforcement for B2, we would repeat the same process. Once we are done calculating for the nominal moment strengths for the bottom and top reinforcement, we will need to check the shear capacity to design the stirrups for shear reinforcement. We first start with the shear capacity, VC is equal to two times the square root of the concrete strength times the beam width times the depth, which comes out to 16.70 kips. We then will calculate for the minimum stirrup area that through these two equations, the first equation 
of AV min is equal to 0 0.75 times the square root of the beam width times the spacing divided by the yield strength, which comes out to 0 0.114 inches squared. And the second equation is AV min is equal to 50 times the beam width times the spacing divided by the yield strength, which equals 0 0.12 inches squared. From these calculations, we decided to use number four ties at 12 inch spacing and the shear area of the number four ties is calculated to be 0 0.4 inches squared. We then calculate for VS, which is the shear strength. VS is equal to the shear area times the yield strength times the depth divided by the spacing, and this comes out to 22 kips. The nominal shear strength VV end is calculated using the equation V times VC plus VS, which equals 29 kips. Finally, we have determined that VVN is greater than VU and therefore our stirrup design is valid. In summary, for the beam design of B1, the top reinforcement will include four number eight rebars, the bottom reinforcement will include three number eight rebars, and the tie reinforcement will include one number four at 12 inch spacing. And for the design of beam B2, the top reinforcement will include five number 10 rebars, the bottom reinforcement will include five number nine rebars, and the tie reinforcement will include two number fives at 12 inch spacing. Hi, my name is Camille Reyes, and I'll be talking about the column design of our project. So far, the following information has been either given or established. The column has to be a rectangular design measuring 16 by 16 in inches. The strength of the concrete is about 4 KSI, and the strength of the rebars are 60 KSI. The dead loads and live loads of the building are also given. For the roof, the dead load is 110 PSF, and the live load is 20 PSF. The typical floors have a dead load of 160 PSF, and a live load of 65 PSF. Due to the location of the building, California seismic requirements are applied. The distance between rebars is limited to 6 inches. The maximum distance between tie bars is also limited to 6 inches. Using the information given, it has been calculated that the best design for a 16 by 16 inch column involves 8 number 6 rebars about 5.375 inches apart, with a clear cover of 1 inch. This applies to all columns. Hi, I'm Tiffany Nguyen. This might be repetitive information, but it's good to recall and repeat our given interest in materials. And so for this reinforcing detailing, we're using concrete strength that is 4 KSI, steel reinforcing grade 60, that is around the yield strength of 60 KSI, number eight rebars for beam and slab reinforcing, number seven rebars for column reinforcing, and number five rebars for wall reinforcing. Pretty interesting how we're using smaller rebars for wall reinforcing, but that's also because we're using number eight and number seven rebars for our beam and slab reinforcing and column reinforcing. So um, we don't wanna put our structure into have uh, too much tension reinforcing, but to have like a good balance of concrete strength, the compressive strength and tension strength. Moving on to development length, it can be determined by the equation given by the ACI code which is three over 40 times the yield strength over lambda times the square root of the concrete strength. And we're also multiplying that by psi e, psi t, and psi s. We chose psi e, psi t, psi s as 1.0 because our rebars aren't going to be coded. And I don't believe our top reinforcement or if we're going to have top reinforcement would be above 12 inches but we are using number seven rebars and for the column and our concrete is normal weight concrete so we're using 1.0 for lambda and our ktr is conservative because we're not there's a possibility we're not using ties, so we don't need to 
multiply the tie spacing or the number of ties. For spacing in the cover dimensions, it could be the first one, CB1 could be found by taking the clear minus seeing the bar diameter divided by two. That's the vertical length of the from the rebar to the top of the our concrete. And or it could be CB2. Um, it's dependent on the bar spacing, which is like one half of the spacing between the bars. Uh, we're just using the 2.5 factor because of the fact that it could be 2.5 equal to 2.5 or less, just to make the calculations easier. And our bar diameter is number seven for columns. Our KD is founded by multiplying three over 40 times the concrete times the yield strength over the square root of the concrete strength, which is 71.15. And putting everything together, uh, we get the development length as 24.9 inches, which is supposed to be greater than 12 inches, which is the minimum length of the development length needed, which is pretty good, quite okay. Not too bad, not too shabby. For the hook development, um, it's different. The equation is different. Uh, it's to determine the development length and uh, deformed bars and tension. So we use the equation given by, also from the ACI code, which is 0 0.02 times psi e times the yield strength over lambda times the square root of concrete strength times the diameter of the bar. We're using psi e as 1.0 and lambda for 1.0 again. We have to multiply it by the modification factors to determine the what kind of hook we need to use. Uh, we use LDH to find what kind of hook we need to use and then multiply it by the modification factors. For uh, uh, LD should be larger than the column width, uh, then we would use the standard 90 or 180 degree hooks. We calculate it from the equation in the previous slide, which was 16.61 inches, and that's the development length for our column, and it's greater than the 16 inch column with dimension. Um, we decided to multiply it by the 0.7 for 90 degree hooks, and we Um, get the required development length, which was 11.6 inches. And if required, if we needed to, we can find the reduction factor. But as you can see, um, I don't have any stirrup or tie calculations, so I didn't really include the reduction factor in this calculation. And we try to find the minimum hook development length, just so that because if it's lower than the minimum, then it's not going to work out well. And 11.6 is greater than 6 inches and 8 times the diameter of the bar. The hook will fit within 14.6 inches of the column. Hi, my name is Jude Thompson, and I will be talking about the splice length of our project. 
the splice length is determined by the lap length, which is 1.3 times the development length. The minimum length of lap for tension lap splices is 12 inches. The area of steel minimum equals 3 square root of F prime C DW times D divided by FY. And we get 3 times the square root of 4,000 PSI times 16 times 16 minus 3 inches of clear minus 0.875 all over 60,000. And we get 0.61 inches squared. So the area of the steel of the corner bars equals 2 times 0.6, which equals 1.2 squared. And that is greater than 0.61 inches, so we're okay. Assuming that the moment diagram is symmetrical, the or assuming that the moment diagram is a symmetrical par parabola, determine the cutoff distances of the first two bars. So the cutoff distance of the first two bars, we get 8.1 feet. Uh, the cutoff distances of the second set of bars is 11.62 feet. Hi everyone, this is Datica. I will be presenting on the cantilever retaining wall design. So for that, we have some design conditions to meet, which is a six feet high cantilever retaining wall that is unrestrained, a soil pressure of 45 PCF, a 10 inch thick wall with five re number five rebars. Area is gonna be 0.31 inch squared. And there's some additional information we'll need to help calculate our demand and capacity for this. So we're gonna do our soil new weight of 110 PCF, a passive soil pressure 350 PCF, force of concrete 4 KSI, and steel yield strength 60 KSI. I just wanted to talk really quickly about for wall design possible failures for it. So there could be overturning the toe, which you'll see this flop over like this way, kind of like angled, sliding of the base of the footing, which you'll see it laterally move. From here towards the left, excessive soil pressure or settlement, which you'll see the wall move down, and there could just be general structure failures. Okay, so let's calculate our factor moment. You're first going to find your lateral soil pressure P, which is going to be soil pressure times height. That gives you 0 0.27 KSF. Next, you're going to calculate the surface force, which is your lateral soil pressure times the six feet high times half, which the 12 inch here is considering uh, one width. And that gives you 0 0.81 kips, multiplying it with the factor 1.6 to get it to our factor force, that's 1.62 kips. Next is our service moment, which will be the height of the triangle that you see here, this guy. That's gonna divide it by three times the factor force, which will be 1.62 kips. Sorry, that is 3.24 kip foot. When our factor moment, you're gonna consider it again. That will be 1.6 times service moment, which is essentially 5.2 kip foot. Okay, so for our reinforcing, you need to consider the depth, which we were given earlier as 10 inches. That's gonna subtract with a clear cover that's typically three inches. So that's seven. You'll calculate your AS, which is 0.23 inch squared foot. Your A compression block depth is 0 0.456 inch. Your C, which is your neutral axis, is going to be 0 0.536. Calculate the CD also, which you'll find it to be a fee factor of 0 0.9 after calculations. And as I forgot to mention earlier, we are trying number five, so that's 16 inch on center. So that's where the 0 0.31 came from here. And for the 16 inch spacing, we're gonna consider it in here. Sorry, went to the next slide too quick, right here. 
and that's where it's considered. So from all the values that we've seen before from calculating and throughout this whole semester, we end up with a PMN of seven kit per foot. We compare it with our moment demand of 5.184 kit foot. It meets, so our design is good, it is adequate. Now, if for some reason it was inadequate, what we would do to provide better moment capacity is decrease the spacing. We could try, for instance, 14 inch next, then 12 inches. So it'll be over here, that would get changed. And then we'll redo the calculations here and see if at the end, the moment capacity will meet our moment demand. But for this case, it meets it, so we are okay. Thank you for listening to my part of this presentation and have a good one. Hello, my name is Eric To, and I'll be going over the basement wall analysis for this project. As you can see, our design conditions involve a basement wall with a thickness of 12 inches, a height of 12 feet, and a concrete strength of 4,000 PSI. The soil pressure to be used for this design is 60 pounds per cubic foot. Moving on to our loading, you can see that with a soil pressure of 60 PCF, we achieve a triangular pressure of 720 PSF or 0.72 KSF. With that, we can find the net force on the wall by finding the area of this pressure. It comes out to be a total of 4.32 kips service load. To find the factored load, we simply multiply this earth pressure load by 1.6, and from that we have a total 6.91 kips factored load. We are trying to design this wall to resist flexure, so naturally we must find the moment demand. To do this, we can treat the wall as a simply supported beam with a triangular distributed load applied to it. The equation for the maximum moment for that condition is two times the total load, F, times the beam length, or in this case, the wall height, L, divided by nine times the square root of three. This simplifies to 0 0.128 times the total load, F, times the wall height, L. The result is a service moment of 6.64 kip foot. To obtain the factored moment, we simply multiply by 1.6, much like we did before. The factored moment is 10.62 kip foot. Now we can design for vertical reinforcing. To begin, we will assume grade 60 number five rebars spaced at 12 inches on center. Our effective area of steel for a 12 inch section of wall turns out to be 0 0.31 inches squared per foot. We can use this to determine the compression block depth, A, which turns out to be 0 0.46 inches. With that, we can find the depth of the neutral axis, C, which turns out to be 0 0.54 inches. From there, we can determine our phi factor by dividing the neutral axis depth by the depth of the rebar, D. We can find that the result is 0 0.06, which lands us with a P factor of 0 0.9. We put that into the moment capacity equation for rectangular sections, and we find that our wall has a moment capacity of 12.23 kip foot. This is greater than our moment demand of 10.62 kip foot, so our wall works. Moving on to our horizontal reinforcement, we followed the ACI minimum requirement for horizontal reinforcing in concrete walls. Following this table, the rebar that we want to use is grade 60 number five rebars, which grants us a row H value of 0 0.002. To find the minimum area of steel that we need, we simply multiply this value with the gross area of concrete, which in our case is the wall thickness of 12 inches multiplied by our section of analysis of one foot or 12 inches which gets us a gross area of 144 inches squared. We have a required minimum area of steel being 0 0.288 inch squared per foot. As calculated previously, we can use number fives at 12 inches on center, which gives us a 0 0.31 inches squared per foot, which is adequate. This concludes our presentation for this project. I'd like to thank my team members, Kigang Lee, 
Christine Lay, Camille Reyes, Tiffany Nguyen, Drew Thompson, and Danica Chan. It was a pleasure working with all of you. Thank you.